I would now like to introduce uh, Neela Anderson DeSalle. She is a Vermont licensed psychologist who has worked with children and families who have experienced trauma for the past 25 years. She has worked for St. Michael's College, her alma mater, Northeast Kingdom Hu Human Services and NFI, and most recently developed a comprehensive trauma-informed special education day treatment program in Northern Vermont by serving as the clinical director, assistant director, and program director of NFI Turning Points for nearly two decades. Currently in private practice in Newport, Vermont, Ms. Anderson DeSalle offers trauma-informed client-centered care to support healing via expressive therapies, somatic work, cognitive behavioral therapeutic work, insight-oriented work, and psychoeducation around the neurodevelopmental impact of trauma upon human development. Ms. Anderson DeSalle speaks on the topics of trauma-informed care, self-care and human development for educators, treatment providers, and organizations. I would now like to welcome Neela Anderson DeSalle. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kim. I am so grateful to be with you all here today, and I would like to extend a special thank you for the professions that you've chosen in general and for the ways you've chosen to use those professions in particular in the last four and a half months. I'm told that many of the people watching today are interested in education, and you may be staff members working at a college, you might be parents of college kids, you might be faculty members, clinicians, therapists, regardless of which role you're serving, your work has been essential to supporting the mental health and the emotional well-being of our people in the past four and a half months. COVID-19, the coronavirus, has posed such a challenge, and we have been a culture of a great deal of chaos and of confusion. Um, and you have done such important work for grounding and supporting our students and our people. I tell my clients that there are five R's that are really important for learning to mitigate anxiety or to reduce stress or to heal from trauma. Those are all related as uh, Kim explained to us two weeks ago. And those five R's are relationship, rhythm, reliability, resiliency, and revision. And you have provided those, four, those five R's in the last four and a half months. You've provided relationships via Zoom, maybe by email, maybe by Google Classroom, by a phone call to your students and to one another. You've provided rhythm in a time when everything has been so unpredictable and so out of order. You've been reliable. When you say you're gonna show up, you do, and, and you're something somebody can count on. When we first had to switch immediately over to telehealth from face-to-face -face health, almost every single one of my clients asked for the same time and day for their appointments. And it helped me to realize how important having resilience. You've modeled that resilience and you've also helped to facilitate that resilience. So thank you very much. The title of today's talk, No Words, the Oxymoron of Trauma Narrative, actually has two oxymorons built in. Now, an oxymoron is simply a two-word paradox. It's a literary term. Um, and a paradox is two contradictory ideas that somehow prove one another to be true. So if I say to you, I have some chocolate here, and this chocolate is bittersweet. If you've ever had a piece of chocolate, you would know exactly what I'm talking about. This dark chocolate is both bitter and sweet at the same time. But what if I said to you, I hold a memory that's bittersweet? It's of my senior year of high school when I fell in love for the first time, and that's not the bittersweet part. The bittersweet part was the end of my freshman year of college when I broke up with that person because I'd fallen in love with someone else. That's a bittersweet memory. Anybody out there who holds a memory like that understands exactly what that oxymoron means. 
Now, the two oxymorons in the title of this talk are No Words and Trauma Narrative. Years ago, when I first became a therapist back in the dark ages, we were encouraged to try to get our, our clients who'd experienced traumas to create a trauma narrative, to tell us the story of their trauma. And what I found very quickly was people would begin trying to talk to me and these episodic flashbulb memories were assaulting them and they'd stammer and they'd swallow and they'd flush. And instead of revisiting the trauma to tell me about it, they were reliving the trauma. And that wasn't what I wanted to help with their healing. Kim did a masterful job our first week here of talking about the human brain and about the different pathways in the brain. And she spoke of the amygdala and the hippocampus and the limbic system, which we see now as the flight, freeze, fight center of the brain. It is the survival mechanism of the brain. And we are wired first and foremost for survival. There is no curiosity in survival mode, folks. And in survival mode, often there are no words. The kick in the teeth for anyone who survived trauma is that not only are there often no words when the traumatic experience is happening, but there aren't any no words. The words for no, stop, don't, no. Even those words, the person who survived the trauma can't access. I would like to give you right up front the three takeaways from today's webinar. Now, this means you could actually walk out of here five minutes into this webinar, but please don't do that. Please stay because I'm really, really interested in your questions and in your insights and in your thoughts. The three takeaways today are first and foremost, that under enough stress, we all regress doesn't matter if we're male or female, if we're straight or gay or transgendered or bisexual, old or young, what our race or our creed, our color, none of that matters. Under stress, we all regress. If we were live, and I get that we're live, but it's so weird because I can't see any of you. So I'm trying to imagine looking at all of you. If we were in a room together, like before COVID, I would show you an orange and a lemon. And I would hand some of these out to the people in the audience. And I wouldn't talk about it until somebody asked me about them. And usually somebody would get hungry and want the orange and ask. So please, somebody out there, if you could remember to ask a question about the orange and lemons and how that relates to how under stress we regress, that would be fantastic. The second takeaway is that every person's life should be worth a novel, a painting, a song, 10 sonnets play, or as a boy who I will call Benji, who was in a, a therapeutic group I ran many years ago once said when we were studying poetry and we were writing haikus, Mila, shouldn't my life be worth at least one fucking haiku? Just one fucking haiku, Mila? Every person's life should be worth a novel because every human life is a work of art. But most of us don't have novels written about us or songs composed for us or sonnets. Or do we? Because I'm going to make an argument that the great writers capture the conflicts and the conditions of the human heart and spirit and mind, that they have written about all kinds of traumas and travails and triumphs, and that if we read enough or listen to audiobooks or have books read to us, we will see ourselves in the work of great writers. I've seen myself in the work of writers from 500 years ago, but more important, I've seen myself absent in novels and seen others and otherness and experiences I haven't had. And the great writers have helped me to build empathy for these experiences I have not had. The third takeaway is that trauma's tracks can be counterintuitive. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if I tell you that I've been working with a little lady who had an uncle who snuck into her room night after night, not to read her bedtime stories, but to uh, molest her, most healthy adults who have healthy instincts would assume that if that child somehow found a way to communicate what had happened, maybe to her teacher or a therapist, maybe via a, a really insightful adult mother of a friend who was listening while she played with dolls, 
that we would assume if this young lady was able to talk about what had happened, that she would not want to be touched and that she especially wouldn't want any kind of sexual touch which had been so harmful, so traumatic for her. But if I told you that that little lady became what we refer to as indiscriminately sexualized and walked into a family party, climbed onto an adult lap and began trying to grab at what we call private parts, that would be counterintuitive, right? Even worse, for the person who's experienced the trauma, sometimes the tracks of trauma are counterintuitive. If I had a dollar for every time an adult who survived trauma said to me, Mila, why did I do that? Why did I do that? I'd be a wealthy woman because trauma can be counterintuitive for the person who's experienced it as well. I would like to weave a therapeutic trauma, trauma tapestry with you, looking to what great writers have taught me and my clients and more important to what my great clients have taught me. To do that, I have to make two disclaimers. The first is that if I speak of a client, I will remove identifying information to protect their privacy. The second is that I have permission, formal consent to speak of the people that I'm speaking about. In my line of work, sometimes when we speak of clients, those are referred to as case studies. My clients will never be my case studies. They are some of the bravest, humblest human beings I've ever known. They come to me with their hearts in their hands, with their terror, with their worry, with their rage, with their fear, with their confusion, with their loneliness. And they ask me to hold those things. And I, need to remain ever hopeful of their healing. I don't ever heal a client. I walk alongside that client as they journey toward healing. I'd like to start with the bard himself, William Shakespeare. I don't think I need to say much more than William Shakespeare because most of us have had to read something by Shakespeare if we were in junior high or high school. But I hope some of you will read some of these if you haven't because you'll be interested in them. In Much Ado About Nothing, William Shakespeare wrote, everyone can master a grief but him that has it. No truer words were ever spoken, right? It's easy to talk about grief. Sometimes we get frustrated when somebody doesn't seem to be going through the stages of grief fast enough. It's easy to objectify grief. But if you've ever experienced a serious grief of your own, you know that it's like walking along the ocean with a memory it looks like a perfect sunset one minute. And then the next minute, you're flat on your stomach. The wave took you. You're chewing sand and you've got rocks up your nose. That's how grief works. And Shakespeare understood that. I would like to introduce you to a young lady named Cordelia. Now, Cordelia is a character in the play King Lear. Um, Cordelia is one of King Lear's three daughters. And she is the daughter of his heart. She is a daughter with heart. In fact, the Latin root for heart is embedded in her name. Cordelia came to me by way of three different referrals. Um, and I should explain that as a licensed psychologist, I have this ridiculously long voicemail because we live in a, a litigious culture. And so if you were to call me on my phone and Kim is gonna give you my um, email and my, my number at the end of this, and I welcome you to do so, you would notice that there's ridiculous long message. And it starts with, um, you know, if this is a medical emergency, please hang up and dial 911. And it goes through yada, 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 yada. Unfortunately, at the time that this referral came in, it also said, if you are seeking a referral, I regret to say that I'm not accepting any and I have a waiting list of over 20 people. Three different people left a message after listening to that long message. The first was somebody in the state's attorney's office who left a very simple message. Some horrors are too horrifying to be born. Please understand I gave your name and number to some people and I'm hoping you'll take the referral. That was the first one. The second one was from a very, very bright and very um, insightful clinician and social worker who worked at a very um, reputable hospital outside of the state of Vermont. Um, and she was very concerned about a child. She introduced me to Cordelia. 
um, in a postage stamp of what had happened. Cordelia was five years old. She'd been in a terrible car accident. Um, the weather was bad and the roads were icy, but Cordelia's dad who was driving was also drunk and high. The car went through a guardrail, it went over a ravine, it flipped three or four times. Cordelia's little brother, who was not seat belted, went through the windshield of the car and was killed. Cordelia's father was in intensive care and they didn't know if he was going to recover, but if he did, he would face vehicular homicide charges. Cordelia somehow crawled out of the window of the car and was found wandering on the highway, covered in blood because she ended up with her own injuries and she had no words. The third referral was from Cordelia's mom, such a humble woman. And she said in this voicemail message, I have experienced trauma. I lived in foster care for good reasons. And I think my daughter's experienced a terrible trauma of a car accident and I'm scared. Could you help her? Well, knock and the door shall be open to you. Persist without exception. I brought her in. She sat down on my couch. I'm in my office right now. So she'd be over here on my left. And she came in rigid, tight. And she climbed up on my couch and she said, do you want me to tell you about the crash? Do you want me to tell you about the crash? There was a light. It got dark. It was red. It was red. Sparkles and sparkles. Sparkles. We spin and we spin and we spin and we spin. Crash! And then she started again. Do you want me to tell you about the crash? Do you want me to tell you about the crash? And I said, Cordelia, I'm, I'm a little thirsty. I was thinking I might get an apple juice or a water. Would, would you like an apple juice or a water? She nodded. And I said, which would you like? And she said, apple juice. Choice and volition are so important for survivors of trauma. And so I said to Cordelia, you know, I'm a little hungry. And I think I might have some raspberries and maybe some yogurt. Would you like some raspberries and yogurt? She said, I like raspberries and yogurt. So we had our food together. And then I showed her the office where the bathroom was, which is really important for people to know they can use that when they need it, where the water could be found. I think pre-COVID, I got to actually take people all around my office. She saw games and art supplies and dollhouses and things she could use, instruments. And then after she left, I spent some time with her mom. And Cordelia's mom said, it's really good, right? She talks about the crash. She talks about it all the time. She's got a lot of words. It's really good, right? And I said, well, have you looked at Cordelia and watched her while she's telling the, the story? And her mom said, well, what do you mean? I said, have you watched the way that she swallows and she stammers and she flushes and she shakes? And her mom nodded. And I said, if we could get close enough, we'd see her pupils are dilated. If I could take her pulse, it would probably be high and her respirations quick and fast. I said, she's not actually really telling us about the crash, she's reliving it. And the mother got teary and said, what do we do? And I said, well, first we figure out what you're already doing right. You've got great protective instincts. You brought your daughter in as fast as you could get her, almost from the hospital you brought her to therapy. So what are you doing right now? And the mom explained that Cordelia had not lived with her she was moving to a new state to live with mom. She also explained that she had only visited on weekends. So I now knew Cordelia had not lived where she was living now. She was going to be going to a new school, new place, new everything. Mom said, we thought we would try to bring things from her old room to her new room because she seems to miss her things. Remember how we talked about rhythm? I said, yeah, familiar things are going to be really important to her. She said, we're also going to paint the room and we let her pick the color. And I said, that's fantastic because trauma survivors need to have agency and instrumentality. I said, could you let her use a paintbrush and paint the room? Mom said, Mila, she's five. And I said, I know, but what we've learned about trauma is that if somebody's gone through a trauma and we cover them in a space blanket and we feed them and we take care of them and we don't ever give them a chance to be instrumental agents of their own healing, they don't heal. So could you give her a paintbrush? Mom said, sure. I said, what else are you doing? She said, well, we enrolled her in a dance class. And I said, that's fantastic because a dance class offers somebody a chance to be in their bodies. Trauma takes people out of their bodies. Bessel van der Kolk talks about how trauma makes people feel like they can't come home. And dance lets us come home to our bodies, not unlike yoga or prayer or meditation or mindfulness or expressive arts or equine therapy. 
So I said to mom, Cordelia's walking a tightrope right now. And she's trying to find her balance. And you've got one end of that rope. And now I've got the other end of your rope. And we're going to build a safety net of people underneath this rope. Mom gave me permission to talk to the guidance counselor and the principal and the pediatrician. And we created the safety net. Little by little, Cordelia explored play therapy and expressive therapy. And little by little, she began to teach me about her language. One day we were playing a game that involved cars and she dissociated. She just checked out for a minute. And then she grabbed my car and she flipped it and she said, you crashed, you died. I said, oh, I crashed and I died. What happens after I die? She looked off. She said, I have dreams. I have dreams. And I said, would you tell me about a dream? She said, I have a dream. I'm following my, my baby brother. I'm running after him. I'm running so fast and I can't catch him. And he sprouts wings and he flies away and I can't get him. And I said, Cordelia, where does he fly to? And she said, he flies to heaven. And I said, oh, how's he doing? She said, I think he's happy there. This gave me a window to a world of Cordelia's belief system that's really important for a psychologist to be able to work with. And then she started to cry. And I said, Cordelia, it's okay to cry. Shakespeare in Henry VI, part three said, to weep is to make less the depth of grief. And I said that, that crying is part of your body's way of helping you to heal. And Cordelia said, I'm forgetting him. I'm losing my memories. And I said, oh, that too is part of how we heal. The memories get less sharp. But if you want, we can build a memory box and we can put into that box the memories you want to hold. She liked that idea a lot. She said, and he could be a crybaby. And I said, oh, sometimes little brothers can be crybabies, huh? What did he cry about? She said, well, the escape game. And I said, what is the escape game? She said it was when uncle would tie us up with ropes and we had to try to escape before he touched our bottoms. Oh. And then, of course, I knew that Cordelia's trauma was complex trauma. And so we began to do a lot of work around the healing, not just of the car accident and the loss of the baby brother and the loss of being with dad, but also around sexual abuse. Cordelia loved to make use of expressive arts and she got better a little bit at a time with a lot of help from mom and a good stepdad and a great school system and a great community. Shakespeare wrote, give sorrow words. The grief that does not speak knits up the overwrought heart and bids it break. She had begun to find her own words, not the trauma narrative, her words. I'd like to use Shakespeare to transition to another writer who's had a profound influence on me and, and on clients I've worked with, and that's William Faulkner. Um, I'm going to use a passage from Shakespeare to transition, though, and it's probably one of the best known passages from Shakespeare. Out, out, brief candle, life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That is from the sound and the fury. Now, I'm sorry, that is Shakespeare's comment, but William Faulkner wrote a book called The Sound and the Fury that was probably influenced by that passage. And it is a tale told by a young man named Benji who has profound learning challenges. Sadly, um, in Faulkner's time, the, the term sometimes used for people with learning challenges was idiot, not a term we would ever, I hope, use now. Benji, who is the central character, or one of them in The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner, came to my care um, via referrals from very worried principals and teachers. He had been in 16 foster homes. He'd been in 12 schools. He was a freshman who could not read or write. He had profound learning challenges that had not been diagnosed, probably because he'd been in so many schools and moved around so many different times. 
Benji had a charismatic personality and the capacity to turn a classroom on its ear. He learned that if he couldn't do what he was being asked to do, he could get people to laugh. Um, and when frustrated, he could become pretty aggressive because he didn't have words to be able to tell people what he was feeling. Benji was in a therapeutic group that I ran many years ago. And when I ran therapy groups, I tried to have them be pertinent to the kids I was working with. So I would get to know these kids first. So I went into a staff meeting and said, I would like to do a philosophy slam with this particular group of boys. And one of my coworkers who became my co-facilitator said, Mila, these are fellows who call women C and X Tuesdays. They punch holes in walls. Some of them have charges pending. Philosophy? And I said, yeah, philosophy. These kids are so close to the epistemological questions, things like, who am I? What am I here for? Why do bad things happen to good people? Is it true that life sucks and then you die? Do I want to be? Do I not want to be? They, they get philosophy. I just have to help them to link to it. So I needed a hook. So the hook I used, um, the kids wanted to play me songs all the time. And a lot of the songs had explicit lyrics. So I went into the group and I said, I'd like to run a group where you bring me a song and I listen to it. And they said, any song? I said, yeah, any song. I said, but the catch is, I play you a song that I think is linked to your song and it'll be from another time. And then I'm gonna present two different philosophers and you're gonna look at your song and my song and we're gonna talk about which philosophy is really in this music. So Benji brought me Eminem's song, Cleaning Out My Closet. It's a hard song if you haven't heard it, listen. I matched it to Bob Dylan's song, Mama, I Ain't Even Crying. And then we talked about Sartre and Nietzsche. And it was an amazing, amazing philosophy slam. Sometime later, um, I needed to run an anger management group. Now I have a question for you. You can't answer me. But have you ever known anybody who willingly signed on for an anger management group? The only time I ever had anybody willingly sign on for an anger management group, they wore a t-shirt that said my anger management instructor is really pissing me off. So I had to find a way um, to get these kids into anger management um, and not have it be an anger management class. So I thought I'd like to do a dream uh, class on nightmares and daydreams. Many of the kids I worked with had terribly disrupted sleep, which is of course one of the fallouts um, of the neurological cascade of ramifications of trauma. Disrupted sleep, trouble falling asleep, People who've experienced complex developmental trauma often have very um, quick resting pulses. Uh, Benji's resting pulse was 120 beats a minute. So long before he got distressed in a classroom or distressed by um, an environmental stressor, his heart rate was way up there. And he didn't sleep well, and he had talked to me about that. So I used this vehicle called the Pop-Up Book of Nightmares, which sadly is out of print. This fabulous book that popped up three feet high and had the dozen most common nightmares in America. Benji would walk around it and just shake his head like those things weren't nightmares at all because his nightmares were so much worse than the pop-up book of nightmares. But to sort of help these kids to begin to recognize that there are the things we can't control and the things we can, we were also doing a piece on daydreams and we had agreed um, we would make the daydream of each member of the class come true if it was reasonable. So one boy wanted to take people fly fishing. He's a big fly fisherman. Fly fishing is fantastic emotional regulation. You're out in nature, the sound of the river, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, casting and reeling. It is fantastic regulation. We made that happen. Um, one of the boys wanted to teach us to cook uh, Chinese food. We made that happen. Um, as we were preparing to make these dreams happen and work together and teach each other about how to manage anger and stress, and fear and loneliness and, and sadness, we were building these dream boards, wide open whiteboards. And there was a method to my madness. It gave us a chance to get up and move around, tear up magazines, draw, get out paint, to move and to act while we were talking because talking is, is tough. And little by little, these boards were just filling up with all kinds of possible daydreams. But week after week, Benji's was completely blank. And finally, my co-facilitator pulled me and said, you know, Neela, the other kids are starting to ask questions. So I said, um, 
I'll stay with Benji today and, and talk to him. And I knelt down and I said, Benji, can I ask you a question about your whiteboard? And he said, yeah. I said, it is so full of possibility. It's so wide open. And it's like an empty canvas just waiting to get full. And Benji looked at me. He said, you see possibility? I don't see shit. And I said, well, Benji, why is it empty? And Benji said, I don't have any dreams. And I said, what do you mean you don't have any dreams? And he said, to dream is to hope. To hope is to trust somebody. And to trust somebody, Neil, is to get fucked over. I don't got no dreams. Hmm. We needed to find a way to help Benji to realize that he, he did have a dream, to dare to have a dream. So I stopped him one day and I said, Benji, I've got this idea. I want to try something with our group today, but I'm really scared. And he said, why are you scared? I said, because I think people are going to laugh at me. And he said, well, what are you going to teach us? I said, I'm going to try to teach us about a way that we can help ourselves fall asleep at night. And he said, I don't sleep for shit. I said, well, we might help you too. And I, I said, but I really need your help. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, Benji, you can turn the classroom on its ear, but you can also get everybody in the room to listen. You are like the most amazingly charismatic person. He said, what does that mean? I said, it means charming and interesting and energetic. And he said, I got your back, Mila. I got your back on this. So I went in and I said, we're going to work on guided visualization today. And the Snickers started. And Benji told them in no uncertain terms to shut up in a more colorful way than I just did. So we're going to listen to Neela. We're going to try it. Now, I had the advantage of knowing that these boys loved the woods. None of them had bad associations with the woods. In fact, two of them slept in the woods in the summer in tents to get out of their homes. And I knew the rhythm and the repetition of nature that helped to nurture these kids' hearts and minds and souls. So I did a guided visualization through the woods. And as I got toward the end of it, I could see that Benji's eyes were closed. And you could have heard a pin drop in the room. And he said, Neela, I just wish I could take you home with me. And you could do this thing. Because I think maybe then I could fall asleep. Nobody laughed. Because every kid in that room had a hard time falling asleep. And I knew then that Benji did have a dream, the chance to dream. William Faulkner wrote, dreams have only one owner at a time. And that's why they're so lonely. That's why dreamers are so lonely. William Faulkner also wrote in my favorite piece by William Faulkner, Light in August, it is because so much happens, too much happens, that's it. Man performs, engenders so much more than he can or should have to bear. That's how he finds that he can bear anything. That's it. That's what's so terrible, that he can bear anything, anything. That could be a definition of trauma, couldn't it? Now, William Faulkner is a quirky fella. Um, it's reported that on his honeymoon, his bride had to be fished out of a pond because she was trying to drown herself because he was so busy being drunk and writing The Sound of the Fury. Brilliant, brilliant man. But he also um, could be quirky, like I said. When he was invited to the White House, he said, it's too far to drive for supper. I love that quote. But he did accept a Pulitzer Prize for fiction in 1952. His acceptance speech, I think, is something that applies to you and me. I think it applies to all teachers. I think it applies to all psychologists. I think it applies to all human beings. And I'm going to ask you to just let me read it. But I'm going to need my glasses because I'm an old person. It is easy enough to say that man is immortal simply because he will endure. When the last ding-dong of doom has clanged and faded from the last worthless rock hanging tideless in the last red and dying evening, that even there, there will still be one more sound, that of his puny, inexhaustible voice still talking. I refuse to accept this. I believe that man is not merely going to endure. 
I believe he will prevail. He's immortal, not because he alone among the creatures has an inexhaustible voice, but because he has a soul, a spirit capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance. Poets and the writer's duty is to write about these things. It is his privilege to help man endure by lifting his heart, by reminding him of the courage and honor and hope and pride and compassion and pity and sacrifice which have been the glory of his past. The poet's voice need not only be the record of man, it can be one of the props, the pillars to help him endure. So my hope is that we will be pillars who help one another to endure. Thank you. Fantastic, Neela. Wow. Just, uh, just a fantastic continuation of the conversation with stories and just so different and amazing. I, you had me in a bunch of different places and it's just all so good. I love the bittersweet chocolate thing and I loved using stories. Neela loves stories and they are just a fantastic way to relay um, messages. So one thing right off the bat, a, a few questions here. Um, there was a, the computer actually held out. There was one tiny little like three second hiccup in the beginning. So you had several people wanting to know the answer when you did the lemon, uh, the orange lemon thing. <laughs> so it, it, it held out. It was just a quick little like, but it was right at that moment of punchline. So sure. And I didn't give the answer. So it's good that somebody thought to ask the question. Um, the orange and the lemon are about our states. Um, if I've had a really good night sleep and I had a great day with my family and I've had a lot of resilience and a lot of good things in my life and you decide to squeeze me, you decide to stress me or something decides to put stress upon me and I'm squeezed, I'm going to give you something pretty sweet because I'm in a good space and I've had a lot of good stuff. If I didn't get a good night's sleep and I'm in an argument with my husband and I've had experiences that are traumatic and you put me under vice, the life stresses me and you squeeze me, under stress we all regress and I'm gonna give you lemon juice. And I, I suggest that we all have orange states and lemon states and it can be really helpful to sometimes say to somebody, I'm in a lemon space right now, please do not stand on my last nerve. Or I'm in a pretty good space, I'm in an orange space. So that's what those are about. Thanks, Kim. Excellent, I love that. Um, well, maybe I should skip to that one then. Okay, so tell me or help uh, tell the uh, your audience um, educators, mix of of also grown ups who work with you know student life and res life and all that stuff. Maybe why it's important to also be aware of your your orange and lemon, and why it's important to have our you know kind of nice metaphorical ways to show us our, our self regulation is what we're really talking about, right? So why is it so important for our age, for whomever, to kind of be aware of our own trauma since like what 60% of us have had something happen by adulthood? Absolutely. I think one of the first things to remember is that as Kim just said, most people have experienced some kind of trauma. And the reality is most of the time people are doing the best they can in the circumstances they're in. And if as RAs or if as teachers or if as people working in the um, lunch areas, and people working in the lunch areas can have more positive influence on students than anybody, I have to tell you. They saved my life in college a couple of times. If people in these different jobs um, can ask questions, open-ended questions of people, rather than making a statement, we, we offer the opportunity to learn from one another. So if somebody seems stressed, and instead of asking them to do something, we say, I'm feeling some stress. How are we doing? We offer the, the door to open on somebody being able to share with us their feelings of stress. I think when we can own our own stuff and share with our students, with our um, residential life people, with our children, how we model and take care of ourselves, they're better able to do it. My son used to be so funny because when I would be under stress, I would say, I just need a minute to do my three, four, five breathing. Breathe in for three, count for four, breathe out through your mouth to five. And he would say sometimes, mom, I think this is a count to seven with your mouth open. <laughs> you go, okay, this means I must need a granola bar or something. But if we can model these things, we give our children, we give our students vehicles to use. And that's part of why I use a lot of metaphor, Kim, when I'm working with people and introduce books, because it's a lot easier to say, hey, I'm having a lemon moment than it is to say, I'm adrift. 
I'm lost. I'm lonely. I'm terrified. Lemon moments a lot easier to stay under stress. I would agree, Neela. Obviously, it's a fantastic metaphor. I like also, since I'm sure we've got a mix in the audience, people with kids in college or young adults in college, you probably may have an eight-year-old at home and who knows. So it kind of, that metaphor can work all the way through, which I really like. It works for families. And one person just typed that, I think it was a tiny little two-second hiccup, when the fourth R, the answer to the fourth R. They were, I sometimes do them out of order, so I'll just do all five. Relationship, rhythm, reliability, revision, and resilience. Perfect. That's all they want to know. Excellent. You got it. You got yeah, because it. It, otherwise the computer held up. It was just at least on this end, just a couple of times. Okay, so da 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 da. Okay, so now I love so the stories in a very general sense. I think they're just fantastic ways to describe things. And again, you know, kind of works across the age range too, because you can obviously change the stories, right? How do you think um, educators and grown-ups working with students in clubs or um, within any kind of anything they're doing on a college campus, um, how do you think this can, they can kind of incorporate this into making like a safer classroom maybe, or reaching students? How can they use stories out in the trenches in the educational, higher educational world? How do you think they could maybe use those? That's a fantastic question, Kim. And I think Dr. Dave gave us a great window to this last week when he said, um, somebody had used the, the phrase, it's okay not to be okay. We need to use expressions like that in our everyday lives. And I find even when I'm doing trainings with adults, I bring in kids books, things like the dog who belonged to no one or the giving tree, which I actually kind of make fun of because I look at the giving tree at stump level or things like the book, I'll love you forever, which is actually models what every kid needs. I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby, you'll be the rhythm and the continuity. But I'll talk openly about how this is every kid's birthright, but most of us didn't get it. This, this picture perfect, love you forever, like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby, you'll be, that translates from one generation to the next. So how do we draw into our hearts, the family of our hearts, our friends, our neighbors, our teachers, our coworkers? So I think we can, we can look to books as springboards. Then we look to our lives as either the validation or the refutation of that. And then we're open to the complexity of, boy, the crib I was born into wasn't the one I wanted, but let me tell you about the crib that I would have liked to have been born into. And we don't judge, we don't assume. And I think we all do sometimes. I mean, my forties were the age of judgment for me, but I had to learn to like step back. And my clients really were the people who taught me that, my students, that you can't judge another person's shoes or their walk. And that by asking a question, by sharing a story or a fuzzy thought or a song, we have extraordinary opportunities. Um, I didn't get to share because I ran out of time, but the young lady, Cordelia, I told you about, decided she wanted to be a teacher. And she came in and she sat here and she was hysterical doing every stereotype of teachers. Neela stood up straight. Neela, eye contact. Neela, if you need to tinkle, ask first. But then she said, it's okay if you don't get it right away, Neela. All I care is you do your best. Good teachers care about doing your best. And then she did this. It's hopeless teaching an old person to dance because her goal that day was to teach me to dance. And she was teaching me to dance to the no song of all things for a kid who didn't know how to say no and learned. She said, I am in my body. I am in my body. I feel my body. You know, Vander Kolk talked about trauma being not being in our bodies, but dance and yoga and storytelling brings us back to our bodies. So not to be afraid to offer those alternative things that people go are woo woo, like breath work or a meditation or a gong or a song or a dance. Because what that kiddo taught me was that by teaching me to dance, she found her body again. And then to realize our students always teach us way more than we teach them, right? Oh, no question. They are humbling. No question. Actually, Neil, that was a brilliant segue, um, even though you didn't know it was coming, because the last one is because the being, obviously, trauma survivors, regardless of what it is, whether involved the body or not, we're, all, we're often separated from that, right? To the yeah. point that sometimes you can't even feel pain and things like that, and just a huge disconnect. So maybe some suggestions 
for the parents out there with their college students, um, uh, professors and, and um, staff working with college students, how might we encourage, if we just kind of smell this trauma, we don't even need to ask if we just smell it, how might we encourage students and ourselves to get back in our bodies? I think, again, we model um, resilience and we model the idea that we're revising ourselves, right? So we can't change what's happened to us. But as Dave said last week, we have control over our responses. And sometimes we're reactive, but when a person is under siege, they don't have a choice. They come out maybe with their teeth and their nails bared. That's a, a, somebody that we know has experienced a significant severe trauma, right? But if we suspect trauma, what we can do is to offer grounding opportunities. And I think parents can talk to their kids about how important it is to have movement in their lives. Yeah, it's important to get good grades and to give it your best, but it's equally important to run and bike and kayak and hike. It's really important if you're feeling lonely to be able to say that and reach out. There are centers on every college campus that are there to help people when they're lonely or scared or frightened or worried. And those are the feelings that link us to other human beings. Confidence, success, brilliance, that doesn't link us to other human beings because there's only so many people who have those things. But being scared, We've all been scared. Being lonely, we've all been lonely. Being worried, we've all been worried. So being open with our kids about our own stuff and being able to say, when you go away to college, this is going to be new and it's going to put you off balance. It's going to make you feel like you're on that tightrope. So what are the things you do to help you stay safe? Who are the people you can trust and reach for in relationships? Call your kids, send care packages to your kids. Oh my gosh, I just said call. I probably should have said email or Zoom or something that's more, you know, whatever. But stay in touch with them. And if they seem like they're pulling away from you, keep calling, keep emailing, keep Zooming, because often it's when they're pulling away that maybe there's something that's happened that they don't know how to tell you about yet. Visit them if you can in person. Encourage them to seek out counseling centers, not because there's a problem, but to make a relationship with somebody so that if they have a stressful final or they have something happen with a roommate, they've got somebody they can go to. And then I think one of the hardest things for parents to do, me included, is to recognize it takes a village to make a happy, healthy kid, right? So to, to be able to draw back and not have any resentment or jealousy about those other wonderful adults who are there in your kid's life. So when your kid's talking about Professor so-and-so, who's the smartest person alive, and the parent's thinking, didn't I say that? Didn't I say that? <laughs> I say, didn't I say that? To say, wow, you have a brilliant professor. And isn't that amazing they took the time to talk to you after class? And then, you know, obviously to watch for flags. We watch for the regression. Does somebody stop eating? Do their sleep patterns change? Does somebody's personality change? Um, do they begin to have nightmares? The, the, the stressor signals are things that we want to step in on if we're seeing those um, and, and get our kids help because sometimes it takes our making a call to somebody to encourage them to get the support that they need. Excellent, Neela. And uh, lastly, this is kind of humorous because I just received a quick message from Dr. Jim Howland, who is the next speaker next Wednesday, saying, great segue, Neela, to to his talk, because she didn't even plan this, at least I don't think she did, because Dr. Jim Howland will be speaking on uh, trauma and mindfulness next week, and this was just kind of one of those universe smoothing it out situations. You have been a fantastic speaker, Neela, just a, real, just a lovely conversation with lots of good tips and strategies for educators and um, anyone else who works with, with students and the you know, parent overlap and sibling, all that just a fabulous conversation. And I can't thank you enough for so generously donating your time today. Thank you. Thank you all the attendees, once again, for choosing your life minutes to be a part of this important conversation.